Hello and good evening to our wonderful family, Chess Council of India. I'm engaging my diaphragm as I'm speaking to you right now. I'm reminded of about two years back when I was on this very same platform to share for the first time in India, our experience and data, a pioneering work on the role of thoracic surgery for post-COVID lung complications. That was the launching pad. CCI was the launching pad. And thereafter, we spoke at NAPCON, TESCON, uh, Indian Association of Cardiothoracic Surgeons, Indian Society of Thoracic Surgeons, but it all started from here. Happiness shared is happiness doubled. So it is with pride and joy that I intimate to you this, this pioneering work saw the light of the day and resulted in its publication in the prestigious Frontiers of Surgery, a collaborative study with Brazil, UK, USA, Italy, and India. When we talk of breathing, we generally refer to the lung. But as doctors, we know diaphragmatic breathing plays a major role. It's synonymous with abdominal breathing, belly breathing. It helps in better exchange of gases, incoming oxygen, and washing out of carbon dioxide. This diaphragmatic breathing, it's not surprising to note that this slows down the heartbeat as well as the blood pressure, thereby giving complete relaxation to the patient or persons who, who do diaphragmatic breathing or develop the habit of this noble and useful kind of exercise. This muscular portion, however, has its share of pathologies. Primarily, it affects in the form of defects as hernias. The most challenging one is the congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Then you have the acquired forms, the form of morgagnes, bogdalics, and hiatus. Thereafter comes the role of paralysis of the phrenic nerve. And this is often seen as neuromuscular disorders due to amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or multiple sclerosis. And at times, birth defects such as congenital central hypoventilation syndrome. Then that small group of, of pathologies, the lesions in the form of tumors, and the benign are bronchogenic or mesothelial cells, while the rare of the malignancies, rhabdomyosarcoma. This is a, an overview to walk us through how to how they present, how to investigate the various modalities of treatment, the outcomes. We have a panel of eminent doctors. Dr. Pallavi Purwar, who's a cardiothoracic surgeon working in Saftajang Hospital, Delhi. Then we have Dr. Tarang Kulkani, pulmonologist in uh, Bombay. The senior pulmonologist, Dr. S. J. Raman from Apollo and MGM. Dr. Nikhil Gupta, the radiologist, the lone wolf of the group, works at Fortis Hospital, Mohali. And to round it off, Dr. Bhushan Tambare, who works in Delhi as well as Max Institute. Now, 
on his lighter weight, diaphragm, a muscular partition separating disorders of the chest from disorders of the bowels. I welcome Dr. Pallavi to share her thoughts and set the ball rolling. Uh, good evening, everyone. It is an absolute pleasure to be part of this CCI webinar. Extremely thankful to Nasser Yusuf sir for his kind introduction. I'm going to talk about the anatomy of the diaphragm. Uh, diaphragm is not just the fence between the abdominal and the thoracic cavities. It is the most important muscle of respiration. Uh, when we look at the development of the diaphragm, it is formed of four structures, the septum transversum, the pleuropericardial fo peritoneal folds, the dorsal mesentery of the esophagus and the uh, body chest wall from the intercostal spaces, the muscular wall. The first structure to develop at four weeks is the septum transversum, which develops from the C3-C4 dermatomes and later migrates down to the region of the abdominal thoracic barrier. Uh, the next structure to develop is the pleuroperitoneal folds, which happen by the uh, folding of the body wall. These pleuroperitoneal folds then subsequently advance and close these pleuroperitoneal canals, which are the communication between the chest and the abdomen, and move towards the dorsal mesentery and the septum transversum. Finally, once this structure is complete, then the muscular body wall starts contributing to make what we see as an adult diaphragm, which has a significant muscular portion on the peripheries and a central tendon in the middle. This is how it looks in the thorax. When we look at the parts of the diaphragm, then there is a costal, uh, the muscular diaphragm is composed of the costal part, the sternal part and the crural part. The crural diaphragm, the right crust extends on the right side it's from L1 to L4 vertebra. It is not only the larger of the two, but it crosses the midline and forms the esophageal hiatus in nearly 60% of the patients completely. The crural ring of the esophagus is formed completely by the right crust. Left crust uh, is the smaller part of the crust, uh, uh, which again uh, goes and attaches to the central tendon. Then we have the costal part of the diaphragm, which arises from the inner and the upper portions of the 7th to 12th nerves. And we have the sternal part arising from the uh, rectus abdominis, rectus sheath and the xiphi sternum. It is interesting to note that there are weaknesses at the junction of the crural and the costal part known as the lumbocostal triangle, which we can see over here as well. These are formed by the fascia, the peritoneum and the pleura and there is no muscle here. Similarly, between the sternal and the uh, uh, costal parts, there is the sternocostal triangle known as Morgagni on the right and Larry's on the left. Coming on to the central tendon, which form is the central part, it is not neither central nor circular. It is a clover leaf shaped structure with a larger right sided limb. It is present more anteriorly than posteriorly because of more muscles on the posterior side. And it is the insertion for all the muscular parts of the diaphragm, the crural, the costal, and the sternal. It is also important to note here that the crural part and the costal part don't just have different functions, they also have different nerve supply and different origins as we discussed in the embryology. So these are the uh, foramens of Morgagni and Larry as we discussed earlier, the bocardelic or the lumbocostal triangles, which is uh, on the left side, the most common cause of congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Other rarer defects uh, in the diaphragm could include a paracable hernia, a peritoneo pericardial communication defect in the septum transversum, or a pleuroperitoneal defect noted uh, uh, just close to the septum transversum and the crural part, which is a defect in the pleuroperitoneal canals. When we come to the blood supply, the majority of the supply is from the superior and inferior phrenic arteries. Both these are direct branches of the aorta and the predominant arterial supply. The other uh, blood supply comes from the musculophrenic artery, which is a branch of the internal thoracic artery, the anterior and posterior intercostal arteries, and the musculophrenic arteries, which we can see here, which travel along the phrenic nerves. The phrenic nerve arising from the C3, C4 and uh, C5 dermatomes travels downwards as the diaphragm moves caudally and then goes through the cable hiatus and into the uh, musculature of the diaphragm, also supplying some part of the upper abdominal organs. 
uh, it is anterior to the hilum on both sides, lateral to the SVC on the right and the arch of aorta on the left side. More important to understand is the uh, distribution of the phrenic nerve on the diaphragmatic surface. As we can see, there are multiple branches arising from here. And if we make a radial incision on the diaphragm, it is likely to cut the phrenic nerve and cause diaphragmatic paralysis. Better is to make a circumferential incision uh, near the costal margin where there is very limited chance of injuring the nerve. The central tendon, if we know anatomically where it lies, then we can make incisions on the small incisions on the central tendon staying away from the phrenic nerves, especially in cases of traumatic diaphragmatic herniation, wherein to reduce the bowel, sometimes you need to increase the incision. We must always remember this anatomical landmarks of the phrenic nerve because it is not always possible to see the phrenic nerve completely. Coming on to the apertures uh, in the diaphragm, we have the aortic hiatus, uh, which is at the level of the T12. This is uh, uh, the hiatus between the crura, which uh, has the passage of aorta, the azygous, hemiazygous, thoracic duct and the aortic plexus. The esophageal hiatus at the level of T10, which is predominantly formed by the right crust uh, and passes the esophagus, the vagus. Uh, the uh, phrenico-abdominal branch of the left phrenic, the esophageal branches of the left gastric artery, and the tributaries of the left gastric vein, the foramen of Morgagni and Larry, which pass the superior inferior epigastric veins, the caval hiatus at T8, which passes the vena cava and the right phrenic nerve, and is located in the central tendon itself. And there are certain minor apertures uh, across the crura um, along the median and the lateral arcuate ligaments. Before I end, I would like to show how it looks on a thoracoscopic view. Here we can see this is the lower lobe of the lung, uh, the IVC and the phrenic nerve behind it. Uh, then we can see these are the vertebral bodies, the white shiny things, the intercostal and the azygous vein. And here lies the diaphragm and the central tendon. Thank you. I would now like to hand over to Dr. Tarang to talk about the physiology of the diaphragm. Thank you for that excellent talk, Dr. Pallavi. I'm Dr. Tarak Kulkarni, and I would like to talk on physiological aspects of diaphragmatic function. But first, I'd like to thank Dr. Nasir Yusuf, sir, for giving me an opportunity to talk on this forum. Before we go into the physiology, there are a few core concepts that we need to understand. The first core concept is zone of apposition. Now, I would like your attention to the top right di diagram on the slide currently. The zone of apposition is correctly illustrated there. So it is the area of attachment between the diaphragm and the rib cage. Now this is extremely crucial and is responsible for the length tension relationship of the diaphragm. So if you are breathing in a phase of deep inspiration, the zone of apposition would be lower, would be smaller. Whereas if you are breathing in deep expiratory phase, when your lung volume is at FRC, the zone, zone of apposition would be greater. This zone of apposition is viewed as something of a marker of respiratory reserve. So to summarize, the zone of apposition is, high, uh, is of high content of muscular tissue. It is mostly rectilinear and is parallel to the rib cage, as we can see in the diagram. And in this apposition uh, zone, the diaphragm thickens with each contraction. Now, this has significant diagnostic implications, which would be taken up in the radiology lecture. Similarly, the dome area has low content of muscular tissue. It is dome-shaped and is perpendicular to the rib cage. When the diaphragm contracts, there is more of a downward translational motion of the dome and the diaphragmatic zone. So, the next concept is for diaphragmatic physiology is that change in pressure produced by the diaphragm contraction generally depends on two major things. The first is the strength and the second is the radius of curvature. This is popularly known in our physics textbook as the Laplace law. So the dependence on strength and the radius of curvature makes the dome of the diaphragm a fundamental determinant in diaphragmatic function. But we have very limited tools for assessing the radius of the curvature or the shape of the dome. So what we use is transdiaphragmatic pressures. So this is a pressure across the diaphragm. Again, if I can have your attention to the right side of the slide, 
the uh, trans diaphragmatic pressure uh, is measured using two pressure transducers and it is generally the difference between the abdominal pressure pressure and the pleural pressures these pressure transducers measure the pressure in the stomach which is a surrogate marker for abdominal pressure and the second transducer measures the pressure in the esophagus which is a surrogate for pleural pressures this difference is trans diaphragmatic pressure and it is accepted as a marker of diaphragmatic function now again this also has very significant diagnostic implication something we would be discussing in the panel discussion so if we look at the movement of the diaphragm during inspiration the diaphragm contracts and its axial length diminishes the dome of the diaphragm descends and the zone of apposition as a result also decreases as the diaphragm descends the intra abdominal pressure increases and the abdominal wall is distended with an outward rotation of the ribs but the abdominal wall opposes the action with an eccentric contraction of the abdominal muscles this is generally manifested as a tightening of the abdominal muscles so here exactly what happens is that the body uses the abdomen abdominal muscles as a fulcrum which helps uh, the body to maintain the shape the shape of the diaphragm dome when the abdominal wall opposes the action it produces a posterior lateral expansion of the lower rib cage and this allows the visceral displacement due to the dropping of the dome of the diaphragm similarly during expiration there is concentric contraction of the abdominal muscles the diaphragm moves more cordially and there is internal rotation of the ribs so to summarize during inspiration the diaphragm moves inferiorly the ribs move up and out the external intercostalis muscle contracts and the thorax increases in volume and in expiration the diaphragm moves more superiorly the ribs move down and and inward the internal intercostalis muscle contracts and there is decrease in the width of thorax so this comes from a paper which was published a few years ago which tells us about a uh, dynamic mri in copd now if you look at all of these mris images a and d are of normal individuals whereas images b c e and f are dynamic mris of patients with copd as you can appreciate in in a and d the dome the shape of the dome of the diaphragm is is clearly seen similarly in b c e and f we can see that there is flattening of the dome of diaphragm so with increased inflation in copd and asthma the diaphragm is flattened therefore it has less room to move and this contraction would be less effective now if so through my short talk the three core messages are that it is crucial to understand the structure of the diaphragm which is an important driver in its physiology the dome like shape is essential to increase intrathoracic volume by its contraction the abdomen is used as a fulcrum uh, through the action of abdominal muscles and it is and it generally ensures the maintenance of the shape of the dome this almost all pathologies of diaphragm can be explained in terms of changes in its three fundamental components its dome like shape of the diaphragm the zone of apposition and the trans diaphragmatic pressures the diaphragm thickens with a contraction in the zone of apposition and this is an important diagnostic pearl which the radiologist will actually talk about and besides respiratory function the diaphragm also has a valuable role in cardiac lymphatic and gi pathologies so this has been my talk thank you so much for listening so patiently i now hand over to dr nikhil who will talk about the radiological aspects thank you uh good evening everyone thank you dr nh krishna and cci family for having me here i also thank dr nasir yusuf dr palvi and dr tarang for introducing the topic i am dr nikhil gupta consultant radiologist fortis hospital mohali today we will be discussing about the imaging of the diaphragm it is the most important muscle in the normal ventilation process and it is a physical barrier which separates thorax from abdomen 
its dysfunction, whether intrinsic or in extrinsic, causes dyspnea. On chest radiographs, on frontal views, the dome of right diaphragm is at the level of anterior sixth rib, and the left uh, dome is usually one intercostal space lower. On lateral views, the anterior part of the left dome is obscured by the cardiac shadow, but the right dome is entirely seen. This is a case showing elevation of uh, diaphragm secondary to pulmonary fibrosis bilaterally here and unilaterally in this one. This is another case showing elevation of right dome of diaphragm, which, uh, which is caused by subpulmonic effusion and mimicking the elevation of diaphragm, which can be confirmed here on CT. On CT, the diaphragm is usually seen as a thin sheath of muscle which separates thorax from abdomen and three typical appearances are seen in axial view. Uh, in type 1, the central tendon is cephalic to the zephyoid process, which is the most common type. Coming to this case, uh, it is showing elevation of right dome of diaphragm with sharp transition between anterior and posterior mar margins, which is eventration of the diaphragm. This is a case of paraesophageal hernia where the GE junction as seen here and here is in its normal position while the fundus of the stomach is herniating through the uh, esophageal hiatus. This is a case showing diaphragmatic atrophy due to polymyositis as seen here. This is a case of diaphragmatic dysfunction caused by transverse myelitis which was confirmed on uh, MRI later on. So this is elevation of left dome of diaphragm. This is a case of diaphragmatic palsy caused by invasion of the right phrenic nerve by the non-small cell carcinoma of the lung. Uh, here in this x-ray we can see herniated viscera of the right lower lung and here on the CT we can see bowel loops and omental fat herniating through the right anterior part of the diaphragm known as the foramen of Margagni as opposed to foramen of Bogdelic, uh, which is posterior lateral, can be on the right, can be on the left. So here we can see a left uh, Bogdelic hernia in the posterior lateral left uh, position. Here we can see a rare case of right Bogdelic hernia. This is a large angiomyolipoma causing inversion of the diaphragm. This is a case of fibrosarcoma of the left dome of the diaphragm. Uh, here we can see a large tumor which is supplied by the intercostal vessels. Uh, this is a case of fibromyxoid sarcoma mimicking the mass of the left lobe of liver and it was seen on angio that it is supplied by the intercostal vessels. This is a case of malignant fibrous histiocytoma causing scallop scalloping over the right lobe of uh, uh, over the capsule of the right lobe of liver. This is a case of a uh, diaphragmatic rhabdomyosarcoma causing mediastinal deviation to the right side. Here we can see a heterogeneously enhancing mass on CT. This is another case of diaphragmatic infiltration with gastric gist. Here a large mass we can see extending into the abdominal cavity. Here we can see nodules on the uh, left dome of diaphragm caused by the metastatic melanoma on the left hemidiaphragm. This is a case uh, of a uh, trauma uh, causing diaphragmatic rupture. This is the diaphragm. No, this is known as the dangling diaphragm sign. This is herniation of viscera, herniation through a defect sign. And the, this is uh, left rib fractures, which is also an indirect marker. Uh, th and this is the dependent viscera sign where uh, the viscera is lying in a dependent position in the thoracic cavity and here we can see abdominal viscera abutting thoracic fluid or thoracic organ sign. This is the post-op appearance where the uh, organs are at their proper place of the same patient. This is a, a collar sign on the right side. And this is a collar sign on the left side where the diaphragm is making a collar and the mass is hump shaped here and here. On fluoroscopy, we do sniff test which, uh, which 
is a simple relatively simple test and uh, easy to interpret on uh, normally on quite deep inspiration and on sniffing the both hemidiaphragm move downward if the sniffing is very vigorous there can be slight paradoxical movement mostly on the right side on in eventration the excursion is reduced on quiet and deep inspiration and may be paradoxical on sniffing the posterior aspect of diaphragm is generally uh, normal so this can lead to a rock, uh, rocking motion on lateral view with anterior part moving up and posterior part moving down on par uh, paralysis uh, there is absent movement of the uh, affected side if it is on one side if it is on both sides the uh, the both sides moves move paradoxically together if there is paradoxical motion so this uh, symmetric motion may first appear to be normal until someone recognizes the that diaphragms are passively following anterior ribs on upward which are upward on inspiration so uh, the findings on weakness are uh, that this excursion is reduced or delayed on deep and quiet inspiration and more severe if more severe weakness is there there may be paradoxical motion but however if there is any orthograde motion or quiet or deep inspiration then it is uh, weakness not paralysis ultrasound is preferred in uh, children and young adults due to its absence of ionizing radiation it is portable and uh, diaphragm appears as a thick echogenic line on b mode here we can see muscle slips which are small curved lines which are concave upwards and are common on right side and here we can see scalloping which are convex uh, upwards uh, which we can see here giving a polyarcuate appearance and it, it is also common on the right side on m mode we can uh, do uh, we can uh, measure the direction of the diaphragmatic motion and the amplitude of excursion it is uh, identical to the fluoroscopic sniff test and uh, on inspiration when the hemi diaphragm moved downward we get a upward peak on m mode so this is shown here on sniffing we get a sharp up stroke as opposed to this and in paralyzed diaphragm we generally don't get any motion but on sniffing we get a uh, sharp down stroke that is a paradoxical uh, motion here we can see on quiet inspiration there is no motion on mri uh, it is no, uh, not widely used however dynamic mri is used for evaluation of diaphragmatic function uh, assessment of excursion synchronicity uh, velocity of diaphragmatic motion is done advantage is that it it has no ionizing radiation but the use is limited by the uh, high costs so here is a case of respiratory failure with 2% saturation at rest and uh, we can see basal atelectasis on ct and mri on cine sequences severe reduced motion of the diaphragm were seen it is weakness due to misthenia gravis here we can see history of respiratory failure with uh, basal atelectasis on ct and mri on cine absence of diaphragmatic movements is seen but there is slight ap movement of the uh, chest so this was diaphragmatic palsy due to polyneuritis this is a case of uh, uh, patient presenting with a history of lower limb weakness and shortening of breath there was hyper intensity in the right dome of diaphragm with absence of the movement of the diaphragm so this was a case of polymyositis which further improved uh, with no hyper intensity on uh, stir it was improved 3 months after the treatment this is a case of congenital diaphragmatic hernia with complete replacement of right lung with the bowel loops and the left lung is normal it is a case of diaphragmatic hydrated with daughter cyst from this liver hydrated we can see which can be seen here this is uh, on radionuclide scan it is uh, limited for assessing integrity in occult cases uh, in and in equivocal images if uh, technetium sulfur colloid is given intraperitoneal it is sensitive for uh, laceration as seen here the, it is uh, accumulating in the right dome of diaphragm while not accumulating in the left dome of diaphragm if it is given iv liver spleen imaging can be done 
uh, and it can show uh, liver injuries and herniation into the thorax so it is essential to uh, differentiate anatomic variation from pathology ct is the powerhouse of diagnosis however mri is a problem solving tool in equivocal cases we have to look from for diaphragmatic pathology in difficult to diagnose cases thank you thank you for your patient listening i now hand over the events to dr nasir yusuf Thank you, Doctor Nikhil Gupta. That was a exhaustive and comprehensive talk. All my question bank is is uh, now left empty because you've answered most of those questions, Doctor Pallavi. That was a very good description of the anatomy, followed by Doctor Tarun's exploits on the physiology. A very tough task, especially for surgeons to understand physiology with all those diagrams. It was very interesting. at this juncture i need to give credit for this topic to the webinar coordinators dr vijay chennam shetty and dr athri gangopadhyay along with the webinar planners dr kirat kaur and dr shivani swami i can see dr jairaman quite eagerly waiting for his turn uh, he is from chennai Apollo and MGM, a lovely, smiling gentleman of pleasant disposition. His forte is the diaphragmatic paralysis, and he was quite well versed, knowledgeable. And over to you, Dr. Jay Raman, for your exposition. Good evening, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Shall I start my PPT? Shall I scan screen, sir? Shall I share my screen, sir? Is it audible, huh, sir? Sir? Yeah, it's audible. Audible. Can I share my screen? Vendors, Amit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. My slide. My is it visible? Yes, please. Yeah. Very good evening. Thank you, moderator, Dr. Nasir Yusuf, sir. so thank you uh, cci chess council of india and the uh, uh, mm -hmm. webinar moderator dr vijay dr kirat dr atri and the founder president dr ns krishna sir and uh, dr narayana pradeepa and president asis and the secretary uh, anil maske so all the stalwarts of the cci family so very good evening so my topic of a discussion today is the management of diaphragmatic palsy see this is example already uh, dr nikhil explained in detail about the elevated left hemi diaphragm see here this is one case left phrenic nerve injury causing the radiological findings of air filled stomach and bowel loops under the diaphragm on fluoroscopy the paradoxical movement was recorded so tarang already mentioned uh, what is the uh, diagnostic uh, diaphragmatic palsy is the trans diaphragmatic pressure among all but the ct scan give all lot of uh, very good ideas so now the how to manage diagnosis for already dr tarun kulkarni and uh, pallavi madam very clearly explained about the causes of the diaphragmatic paralysis there are two main uh, causes one is the congenital and the acquired causes in the acquired there are lot of causes like infectious inflammatory neoplastic traumatic and the neuromuscular etc so the management of diaphragmatic palsy the treatment of diaphragmatic palsy depends on both the cause and the amount of impairment of respiratory function the concurrent medical conditions known to compromise respiratory functions like obesity and sleep apnea and copd chronic obstructive pulmonary disease should be adequately treated before definitive treatment for diaphragmatic palsy inspiratory muscle training the role of physiotherapy the rehabilitation medicine pulmonary rehab is very important the inspiratory muscle training has shown to improve diaphragmatic pressure in patients with copd spinal cord injury and post cardiac bypass uh, diaphragmatic palsy coming to the unilateral diaphragmatic paralysis most patients with unilateral paralysis do not require any treatment as most causes of hemi diaphragmatic diaphragm palsy are transient 
complete recovery is expected with time some patients may benefit from nocturnal ventilatory support in the form of uh, not there is a non invasive post operative ventilation if the weakness persists for more than a year diaphragmatic ligation can be done in this procedure the flask hemi diaphragm is made taut by overswinging the membranous central tendon and the muscular peripheral part this will decrease the workload for the normal contralateral hemi diaphragm and improve ventilation perfusion of the ipsilateral lung base in recent times wads procedure that is video assisted thoracic surgery is used for diaphragmatic placation in selected patients this <laughs> procedure has been shown to decrease dyspnea and improve the functional capacity however this procedure should not be done in patients with a morbid obesity because a lot of course of complications uh, may develop during the procedures and after the procedures in the case of morbid obese people and uh, progressive neuromuscular disease people also will face lot of uh, post operative consequences bilateral diaphragmatic paralysis should not undergo placation coming to the bilateral diaphragmatic paralysis for bilateral diaphragmatic weakness non invasive positive pressure ventilation is the viable non surgical treatment option the criteria for starting this therapy is not very clear but most experts recommend treatment if the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is more than 45 mm of mercury higher and oxygen saturation is less than 88% this is the indication for the uh, that is a uh, ventilator strategy mainly the non invasive ventilation in patients with a progressive neuromuscular disease leading to diaphragmatic palsy with reduction of maximum inspiratory pressure that is uh, map of less than 60 mm of mercury reduced to forced vital capacity of less than 50% or absolute reduction in vital capacity of less than 20 ml per kilogram will benefit from non invasive positive pressure ventilation with the progression of the disease tracheostomy with mechanical ventilation may be required early and prompt initiation of the non invasive positive pressure ventilation has been shown to improve the lung function quality of life and uh, overall survival so the ventilatory strategy is a very important in a case of diaphragmatic that is a bilateral diaphragm palsy few words about the diaphragmatic palsy this procedure so technically this procedure is, is demanding but this is not commonly performed procedures in our place this are the procedures done majority in the western world the indications are very clear that selected patients with the bilateral diaphragmatic paralysis with a persistent respiratory failure and intact phrenic now this is important intact phrenic now may benefit from the phrenic now pacing in this procedure the phrenic nerves are electrically stimulated using implanted electrodes to restore physiological functions of the diaphragm patients with a high level cervical cord injury on mechanical ventilation for at least 3 months showed a significant improvement in their outcomes and some patients were completely liberated from the ventilator this procedure is technically challenging and uh, despite the improvement in the pacing technology the diaphragmatic response is not sustained so our experience is mainly the diaphragmatic surgical intervention or the ventilatory strategy using the non invasive post pressure ventilation or invasive ventilation so to conclude most patients with unilateral diaphragmatic palsy are detected incidentally and do not require any specific treatment while most patients with bilateral diaphragmatic palsy require permanent ventilatory support <coughs> selected patients with persistent respiratory failure can benefit from diaphragmatic placation or phrenic now pacing so thank you very much for this opportunity thank you yeah. thank you dr jayaraman i will we have almost finished with the four speakers so maybe after dr bhushan we will get down to the actual panel discussion uh, it wouldn't be fair on uh, dr bhushan if we don't give us opportunity now dr bhushan please thoracic surgeon you please unmute yourself bhushan no there's some problem with the audio dr bhushan
Can you hear now? Yes, thank you. Yeah. So, thank you, Dr. Nasir, uh, and the uh, whole CCI family for giving me this opportunity to speak. So, uh, myself, Dr. Bhushan, a thoracic surgeon working at Max Cancer Institute, uh, Vaishali and Patpar Ganj. So, uh, I'll be there just... Uh, uh, I think so. We can start with the panel discussion. Yeah. Okay. I'll put the questions. Can I put the questions to you? Yeah. 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 So, your area of interest, I understand, are diaphragmatic tumors, trauma, and you yes. know, briefly, you've not touched upon anesthetic concerns. Both yeah. anesthetic concern is a major area for the pulmonologist in the preoperative workup to assess during surgery and in the post-op. So, we, unfortunately, we don't have an anesthesiologist today with us. Dr. Bijal had to opt out for pressing urgent personal reasons. Could you just briefly tell us about uh, any anesthetic particular areas we should be looking for? Yeah. So, anesthetic considerations uh, in case of diaphragmatic pathologies, we should consider that already ex pre-existing uh, diaphragmatic palsy. Uh, one thing. Second thing is uh, iatrogenic or surgeon-induced or tumor-induced diaphragmatic palsy intraoperative. And third thing is the traumatic rupture of diaphragm and the diaphragmatic hernias. These four categories should be discussed because the anesthesia uh, is different. And the management varies uh, is specific. Yeah, good, good. Thank you. So I will brief out uh, how anesthesia affects breathing. Please. So most of the anesthetics cause loss of muscle tone that is accompanied by falling, resting lung volume. And lowered lung volumes promotes cyclic or continuous airway pressure. And high inspired oxygen fractions cause rapid absorption of gas behind closed airways, resulting in atelectasis. This is during normal person undergoing anesthesia. And how does anesthesia affect diaphragm? Anesthesia with or without pharmacologic paralysis reduces our normal end expiratory muscle tone and also it produces cephalate shift of the end expiratory position of the diaphragm. So, in cases where there is already pre-existing diaphragmatic palsy, uh, positive pressure ventilation is required and there might be some problems with extubation depending on the pre-existing diseases like COPD or other lung condition where gas exchange is impaired. There might be retention of CO2. If a patient with a unilateral diaphragmatic palsy and normal lung function and pulmonary function test may not experience anything during anesthesia and even during exp ex uh, extubation. But a patient with borderline PFT or some other COPD may have difficult extubation. There, should, there are chances of reintubation and or these patients might require CPAP support post-operatively. So considering anesthesia in cases of traumatic diaphragm rupture and diaphragmatic hernia. Now the special considerations are the abdominal viscera are into the chest where there might be a valvulus, there might be rotation. Uh, so inhalation anesthesia, anesthetic agent should be avoided. Total intravenous anesthesia is used. A rapid sequence intubation, a double lumen or a single lumen tube as per the surgeon and anesthetist for plan for management of the case. But that was quite uh, extensive. Dr. Thomas, just one last question on this point is that, you know, a diaphragmatic palsy is a chronic process. Unfortunately, if we have uh, an injury on table to the phrenic nerve, or a patient comes with acute with a traumatic rupture, would that affect the post-op recovery from a patient who has been having a palsy for, from before? 
a uh, patient having a pulsiform before may not have much problems because he uh, might have accustomed to that uh, pulsed diaphragm but a patient who has a, uh, who developed a palsy intraop due to uh, frank nerve injury or uh, frank nerve being excised along with the tumor in that case the surgeon will decide to plicate the diaphragm if he notices intraoperatively and if it is not noticed intraoperatively then there might be problems with extubation depending on the pre existing uh, lung conditions so you might have to ventilate the person yes. post operative can i come back to dr tharan because he was talking about physiology earlier uh, you mentioned the pathologies if you like you could just uh, mention it uh, in a more elaborate manner and a brief mention of the investigations how would you like to investigate the patient how would a pulmonologist look at this patient sure sir am i audible yes thank you yes so uh, if we look at the spectrum of diaphragmatic disorders so uh, so first of all the most commonly talked about diaphragmatic disorders is a diaphragmatic dysfunction which could be unilateral or bilateral and there are various causes which would actually cause this diaphragmatic dysfunction right from cns injuries to phrenic nerve injuries to myopathies to disorders of neuromuscular junction or there is also during the covid times we encountered something called as a ventilator induced diaphragmatic dysfunction which is very common seen for people who have ventilated for a very long time then there are congenital diaphragmatic elevations uh, or congenital diaphragmatic eventrations then as dr bhushan said about diaphragmatic traumas which is blunt uh, possibly after an automobile accident or a penetrating after gunshot or stabbing wound then there are hernias which we also which one speaker also talked about and then uh, there is also diaphragmatic flutter which is involuntary contractions of myoclonus involving the diaphragm and then there are finally there are tumors of the diaphragm which could be benign cystic benign solid could be fibrosarcomas or metastatic malignancies from primary lung esophagus or mesotheliomas so the diaphragm per se also has a wide spectrum for diaphragmatic disorders so when you mention this neurological problem in your experience have you how often have you seen hypertrophic osteoarthropathy or is it just at the books so uh, my uh, hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy we have seen more in cases of lung cancer rather than all the other so i feel uh, the more common uh, uh, causes of diaphragmatic dysfunction that we see are most likely post surgical and uh, in patients who are having some sort of a cervical cord injury or a cervical cord trauma but that's a any other forms of presentation so uh, in terms of presentation so presentations also there's a very wide spectrum of how a patient would actually come to our clinic so one of the more common things is when there is an asymptomatic elevation of a diaphragm when a patient has got a chest x ray done as a part of his health checkup examination so the most commonly this is the sort of uh, reference that we get that there is an uh, there is an elevation and what to do with it similarly there could be patient with diaphragmatic dysfunction could or uh, could also present with with orthopnea and most of these patients are generally uh, uh, referred to the cardiology department thinking that this is congestive heart failure these patients could also have dyspnea on exertion and uh, are generally Uh, referred as a presumptive case of obstructive airway disease uh, patients with diaphragmatic dysfunction also could have uh, concomitant sleep issues so they also get frequently referred to sleep clinics because they can't lie flat which is more common actually with bi bilateral diaphragmatic di uh, disorders uh, similarly the third spectrum the third kind of patients could uh, are also patients on the ventilator where the critical care intensivist is having a very difficult time in weaning these patients so the presentation of diaphragmatic disorders also has a very wide spectrum from the asymptomatic part to someone who's on the ventilator and who is not getting weaned oh that was that was uh, interesting very interesting uh dr purvar can i put this question to you yes sir uh, you were talking about hernias yes sir yes and you seem to be a very an expert on that area uh could you just start off with say something about congenital diaphragmatic hernia the management and what's the prognosis outcome briefly 
yes sir well, i'll just start with telling what a congenital diaphragmatic hernia is uh, generally these are defects in the diaphragm which are not born necessarily because of pathology in the diaphragm what happens is that first there is pulmonary hypoplasia and because of that pulmonary hypoplasia and the increased intra abdominal pressure uh, the foramen of bogdalic that we spoke of the posterior lumbocostal trigone from there the weakness happens and generally that's the most common site from where uh, uh, abdominal viscera then secondarily herniate into the Uh, chest so that is how the patient presents with cyanosis and failure to thrive uh, and yes in today's times we can make an antenatal diagnosis uh, if we have made an antenatal diagnosis there are treatment modalities available uh, we could either uh, consider uh, corticosteroids for the mother uh, it's not very proven it is still controversial but yes some uh, series have shown very good results second thing that we can do is uh, tracheal occlusion Uh, the indication i mean the implication is that if we do a fetoscopic or a hysteroscopic tracheal occlusion then it can promote lung development the next crucial question that comes for a congenital diaphragmatic hernia is when to do the delivery of the mother so if we have diagnosed it and uh, prenatally or antenatally then uh, initially it was believed that we should do a preterm delivery so that we get the baby out and then treat uh, very soon but now it is considered very important to uh, take the baby to the term deliver the baby at term now we come up to what uh, is more significant which is the post operative management a uh, post birth of the baby generally these babies can present in two ways one would be they are asymptomatic and others would be who have present with cyanosis or a pulmonary hypertension the most dreaded problem with the congenital diaphragmatic hernia is a pulmonary hypertension so if it is a blue baby and we are suspecting a diaphragmatic hernia first is no bag and mask ventilation the rest of the management is uh, in the pediatric icu with the, with or without the support of ecmo uh, and most of these kids have very poor prognosis and surgery has a role but we all have to understand that even if we are trying to force a early surgery reduction of those hernial contents is not going to reverse either the pulmonary hypertension nor the lung hypoplasia so although surgery is necessary once the child is optimized it is important to understand that surgery is not going to be affecting outcomes in the immediate period it is only for long term that we reduce the contents to give space for the lung to expand so uh, <clears throat> timing of surgery is the most crucial thing that is to be considered when we are dealing with a patient uh, whenever we get a call for a congenital diaphragmatic hernia it depends on two things whether the patient is on ecmo or not if the child is on ecmo then uh, it becomes more and more controversial when to operate when the child is not on ecmo at 48 hours of birth we can go ahead operate reduce the hernia and wait for the lung to develop better because what happens when we reduce the contents and close the diaphragm is that it gives more space to lung giving the lung a chance to develop fully and uh, managing in the icu so that uh, the pulmonary hypotension can be controlled but when the child is already on ecmo then it is very controversial because some people would wait for the patient to be weaned from the ecmo before they go in for surgery and there are other centers who would try to uh, take up for surgery if ecmo is failing we have to understand that worst outcomes are when we are trying to do the surgery when ecmo fails best outcomes are when we are able to do surgery after the child has been weaned from ecmo so predominantly the management is icu in the postnatal period and once the child stabilizes that is what i would say is the gist uh, once the child stabilizes it is important to reduce the content re repair the hernia and the best thing to replace the diaphragm diaphragm with is a gotex mesh because it's a child a proline mesh which we can use in adults but in a child we should not use a proline mesh so thank you dr pallavi i see a big smile on your face uh, can i get dr nikhil in here for do you talking about congenital diaphragmatic hernia is prenatal can you how find the diagnosis how early can you find this problem uh, uh yes we can find it very early uh, like i showed in an mri we uh, as early as 32 weeks even earlier we can uh, do it on ultrasound like in second trimester second trimester but not before that so no, no. we have to carry through the pregnancy we have no choice of it like uh, after 13 weeks sir yes we have to go through so coming back to the again to dr jairaman see you you have mentioned about diaphragm and how would you say you you have been exhausted you have talked about even pacing i really have not many questions left for you uh, in your practice 
you have covered everything you know causes diplomatic basic uh, uh the treatment you have talked about bilateral policy there's really nothing been left to ask you on that count but in your practice um what was the most challenging case we have been uh, dr pallavi said about congenital diaphragmatic and hernias those are really mind boggling and with poor prognosis but in your practice with an adult practice how many what is your percentage of patients broadly i know it's we not we don't just have done a study of diaphragmatic palsy some are symptomatic some are not so symptomatic and any challenging case we had mentioned earlier about myasthenia causing a uh, problem with the guy from any some similar experience you have yes sir thank you so in my experience when i'm working in uh, apollo or mgm and bullock hospital we come across cases usually we get referral from the mainly from the uh, mass health checkup department there is a preventive health check department the incidental findings of the elevated diaphragm so the radiologist and the final report came as uh, diaphragm elevation pulmonologist opinion so they refer to me so we evaluate majority of the time patient is asymptomatic we ask for previous chest radiography if the previous chest radiography also same there is no symptoms at all there is no risk, risky factors like any bronchogenic cancer or other uh, you know malignant etiologies so patient is asymptomatic so routinely we evaluate for any pulmonary function test if it is normal so we can reassure the patient so six months or near later we we'll repeat the uh, chest radiography and if necessary we'll go for the pft any uh, you know, high risk individuals like smokers and other thing we advise to stop smoking so in this way in the case of uh, asymptomatic incidental diaphragm elevation patients we advise these patients from the uh, uh, refer from the uh, mass health check department preventive medicine department this is the one category we come across our patients and other group of patients we refer from the uh, post surgical patients post surgical icu patients mainly the post cardiac bypass surgery patients recently also we have one patient in uh, 65 year old male patient underwent a cabg for tubal vessel disease second day onwards after the extubation patient is not maintaining the saturation patient is developing some kind of tachypnea tachycardia saturation is falling down so chest radiography shows there is a left side haziness left to lower than haziness and right side minimal haziness so we thought it is a post operative fluid collection pure effusion otherwise there is a minimal pure effusion but uh, the uh, secretions and a lot of things we are not able to maintain with the simple oxygen and all patient requires uh, the uh, non invasive ventilation with the uh, cpap support patient is alright if you withdraw the cpap support this is again dropping saturation today is i think is a 10th post operative day still patient is requiring this uh, problem three days back we did the uh, ct scan ct scan showed there is a left diaphragm eventration so causing the left lower flaps this is the main culprit behind the uh, this is a common indication common commonly we come across patients like the post uh, cabg cases some of the patients they have a Uh, temporary there is a brief period of uh, diaphragm palsy so these patients mainly they require the uh, nid that is a, a non invasive post operative ventilation either cpap or bipap this modality of treatment slowly two weeks to two months period patient will be all right because this is the mild injury to the phrenic now during the uh, no memory uh, no uh, harvesting and other uh, injury to the mild neuropraxia it will recover two weeks to two months time so this is a common case come across and one more important thing from the emergency department traumatology department we receive the cases of the blunt trauma multiple injuries rotorotic accident patients so we receive the patients with the chest pain and the x-ray shows there is a multiple rib fracture ct scan showing there is elevation of diaphragm so these patients particularly we stabilize the patients abc protocol airway breathing circulation then we suggested to get the opinion from the thoracic surgeon after the initial evaluation like the ct scan and ultrasound showing there is a diaphragm palsy a diaphragm rupture diaphragmatic repair we asked for the thoracic surgeon help in the form of the application uh, either thoracoscopically or thoracotomy and laparoscopically depends upon the center expertise so we usually any uh, traumatic diaphragm rupture we involve day one itself the thoracic surgeon to do the uh, um, application of the diaphragm or the diaphragm uh, uh this is the use of gotex patch or other patch material 
we are going to undergo the procedures using the uh, this uh, help of thoracic surgery. So this is the common uh, indications we come across as a pulmonologist in our center. In our center, yes. Dr. Bhushan, are you ready? Yeah. Yeah. So, can you tell us something about diaphragmatic tumors? Yeah. Can I share my screen? Yes. Just sharing my screen. Can you see the screen? Are you yes. able to see the screen? Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. So, coming to diaphragmatic tumors, as such, primary diaphragmatic tumors are rare. And there are the most common benign cystic lesions, which are bronchogenic and mesothelial cysts. There might, you can encounter sometimes lipomas, desmofibroblastomas, which are extremely uh, rare soft tissue tumors. Malignant tumors, which are encountered sometimes are rhabdomyosarcomas and fibromas. So diaphragm most commonly is involved by the adjacent organ. Uh, tumors like thoracic and abdominal tumors which may secondary involve the diaphragm diaphragmatic metastasis although rare but have been reported in the literature uh, either they derive uh, uh, derive from the lymphatic supply or the hematogenous spread so uh, brief history Granscher this dis uh, had discovery of fibroma in 1868 uh, during his uh, during autopsy and uh, there are some reports about uh, cases, about 49, 44 cases by various uh, uh, people across the globe. So uh, the, some of the diaphragmatic tumors are angiofibromas and adeno, uh, adrenal cortical tumors, cordomas, fibromas, fibrohemangiomas, hemangiocytomas, and uh, malignant tumors are fibromyosarcomas, liposarcomas, leomyosarcomas, so all in all, uh, one should be able to distinguish a diaphragmatic tumor from the adjacent lung tumor or the liver, uh, liver tumor as uh, discussed by the radiologist. So there is no characteristic symptom as such, but may sometimes present as chest discomfort or heaviness or may have referred pain to the shoulder tip. A chest X-ray, a CCT or MRI is best to distinguish uh, its origin. While whole body, when if any suspicion, a whole body pet CECT is the uh, is indicated. A CT or USG guided biopsy can be done depending on the pathology and local organ infiltration, surgery plus reconstruction or prime modality treatment. These are some of the examples uh, of adjacent organ spread which I could encounter in my practice. There is a tumor deposit in case of uh, epithelioid mesothelioma where you can see uh, the highlighted FDJ avid area. This is a solitary fibrous tumor uh, near the costopericardiophrenic area uh, where uh, histopathology came out, solitary fibrous tumor, but area of origin was not known. So all these tumors, diaphragmatic tumors, if they are located just to the diaphragm, uh, fibrosarcomas and liposarcomas, if they are small enough, they can be excised with or without reconstruction. Small tumors less than 5 centimeters, the diaphragm can be sutured straight forward with proline or silk sutures. But uh, larger tumors will require total excision of the diaphragm and reconstruction by autologous uh, tissue like ileotibial tract uh, or a Gore-Tex mesh or a proline mesh or a dual layer mesh. Oh, that was quite interesting. Uh, just to if I could be permitted to add on, uh, yeah. takes me back 20 years when I first started my practice in India, was we came across this unusual case where the patient presented with diet, you know, severe dyspnea, but we could not find a cause. And those were pretty early days of CD scan, uh, came out as normal. Uh, but they said there's a lesion which is not very clear, whether it is supradiaphragmatic or inferior to the diaphragm. But then we went in and opened it turned out to be fortunately for the patient a leomyoma which is extremely rare uh with rhabdomyosarcoma what is the you know what is in your opinion the prognosis recurrence rate is it worth doing surgery uh, if uh, most of these tumors rhabdomyosarcomas will be detected when they are large producing mass effect on the uh, local organs and uh, this thing very rarely 
uh, they might be incidentally detected and worked up then only these might be excised with taking margins but uh, large rhabdomyoid sarcomas the prognosis remains poor we can offer them chemo radiation that's all dr taran are you there with me yes 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 yes, yes uh, <laughs> by uh, you know you've uh, talked about investigations would you like to add something more on investigations how would you investigate a patient with um, a diaphragmatic pathology so uh, so if you look at the overview of investigations so the most easiest way of actually uh, i mean at least screening a patient for diaphragmatic dysfunction is just pulse oximetry so this is something that we do commonly for a patient who is suspected we just ask the patient to lie down and then we check the check the pulse uh, the the saturation uh, this could be also done by the patient when he is lying down on the paralyzed side so this also could actually give you a a clue then chest radiography ct mris of course i think our radiologist colleague has has outlined it perfectly then we come to sniff testing which can either be done using under fluoroscopic or ultrasound guidance and this also was uh, was shown by dr nikhil in his slide so in the sniff testing a positive test is the one that shows paradoxical elevation or no movement of the paralyzed diaphragm then we come to lung function test which is like a, a pulmonologist domain uh, so in lung function test generally there are a few parameters that we generally try to look for in lung function test you would uh, you would have a restrictive pattern on the spirometry which would mean a low fvc a low vc a low vital capacity a low total lung capacity and a normal fev1 by fvc ratio uh, but what is interesting here is that uh in a few cases that dlco could be decreased to because of the basal atelectasis more commonly seen in bilateral uh, diaphragmatic dysfunction uh we tend to repeat a spirometry again in supine position so in normal individuals uh we expect the forced vital capacity or the vital capacity to go down uh, less than 10% in unilateral diaphragmatic dysfunction though the fvc will fall by more than 10% on supine position whereas on bilateral uh, diaphragmatic dysfunction the fvc or the vc will be decreased by more than 50% so this definitely is uh, something that clinches a diagnosis of diaphragmatic dysfunction there are various other, other tests also uh, which assess the respiratory muscle strength these are the maximal inspiratory maximal expiratory pressures so since the diaphragm is something that drives the inspiration uh, in inspiration of our breathing the maximal inspiratory pressures are generally less than 60% predicted now this is true for unilateral and bilateral uh, diaphragmatic dysfunction so you would be looking for a decrease in the maximum inspiratory pressures or something that is called as a sniff inspiratory pressures which is used with a catheter in the nose so other than that there are a few more functional a uh, specific uh, uh, functional assessment test for the diaphragm these are tests like electromyography then the measurement of trans diaphragmatic pressures using those two electrodes in the in the stomach and the esophagus and then there are also newer methods like phrenic nerve conduction studies which can be coupled with these for specific diagnosis so this is general overview of investigations for assessment of a patient with diaphragmatic pathology yeah briefly briefly dr nikhil in your opinion that was very nice of you tarak very exhaustive uh, and lightly dr nikhil in yes, what would you suggest single test you know you mentioned mri which doesn't seem to be very effective but if you have If you are given an option of a single test, what would you prefer? A single test, sir, depends on the patient and the uh, uh, condition in which the patient is. If uh, a very sick patient is there, we can use ultrasound. But uh, if a patient is partly mobile, we can also use fluoro. Fluoro is used. Uh, it is uh, the gold standard of investigation. Fluoroscopy. Thanks. yeah and uh, newer investigation is mri which also helps in functional assessment 
and it is a problem solving tool so would you say in one hour, one sentence that a patient who is not very sick ultra sound will clinch the issue so pulse uh, clinch issue fluoroscope thank you uh, dr pallavi you know we had mentioned about cdh congenital diaphragmatic hernia uh, something about adult hernias briefly Uh, so then how would you treat? How would you approach them? Is the approach the same for all three of all the others, or is it a little different? Uh, sir, there are like uh, four different types of hernias that can uh, occur in an adult. Uh, we can have an anterior hernia, which can be a Morgagni or a Larry's. The content is generally fat, and the patient generally presents only with pain. It can be left alone, and if uh, there is a significant pain, we can uh, do a primary repair. That is all that is needed uh, in a Morgagni hernia. the second is a bogdelic hernia which is a left posterolateral hernia which occurs in an adult these have to be repaired whether it is right sided or left sided uh, it is diagnosed on a ct most commonly patients may or may not be symptomatic generally in adults they would be symptomatic because there will the defect uh, gradually increases over time and then from just the omentum there's the stomach which herniates and then others other organs also herniate these patients very rarely present with the volvulus i mean uh, it is said uh, that yes that's the most uh, life threatening complication but they very rarely present with the volvulus uh, so uh, in adult hernias uh, in adult uh, age group uh, detected bogdelic hernias mostly the diaphragm is very very thin out and papery and it is recommended that uh, primary closure should not be done and we should use a mesh repair uh, then when we talk of hiatal hernias it's a different pathology altogether because uh, we have to understand that crural diaphragm and the costal diaphragm are two different uh, organs in itself because they have different origin different work and everything so hiatal hernia is also predominantly a medical disease in today's times because what it causes is hiatal it there's a weakness in the esophageal hiatus so our gastroesophageal junction that kind of moves up so this hiatal hernia uh, uh, can be of four types the first would be the most common type is the sliding hernia wherein the gastroesophageal junction moves up and it comes back to its normal position as well the second type is a type 2 uh, hiatal hernia would be where in uh, on the side of the gastroesophageal junction the gastroesophageal junction stays in the abdomen itself but uh, stomach herniates from the side of the hiatus the hiatus which is slightly larger and the stomach will herniate on its side these are the patients which most commonly present with the volvulus if at all or they may also remain asymptomatic a sliding hernia is uh, a type 2 hernia is an absolute indication for surgery because uh, when the stomach starts moving up and down we should not uh, keep it on conservative a type 1 hernia we would do surgery only if there is a very high suspicion of malignancy if there are extra esophageal symptoms this would be very interesting for the pulmonology community uh, the most common extra esophageal symptom that occurs in a patient with the gerd and hiatus hernia is uh, segmental pneumonia because what happens is there is uh, passive uh, reflux of acid and there is micro aspiration which causes segmental pneumonia in the lungs and patients very often would present uh, Uh, to a pulmonologist with a pneumonia instead of uh, going to a gastroenterologist with the reflux symptoms so uh, and, and any extra esophageal symptom is an absolute indication for doing surgery surgical repair of a type 1 hernia then type 3 hernias are where there is a component of both uh, type 1 and type 2 these again must be repaired and type 4 is when the hiatus becomes so big because of chronicity of the problem that in addition other organs like liver and other parts of uh, or spleen can herniate into the chest Uh, these hernias generally are confined to the mediastinum in contrast to bogdelic or uh, morgagni which are uh, into the thorax but yes they all need surgical repair and surgical repair is also different for these hernias what we need to do is we need to strengthen the hiatus so we do what uh, we do a procedure which is called as fundoplication so it can be a complete fundoplication which was the traditional procedure where which was called the 360 degree wrap nissen's fundoplication what we essentially do is that we rotate the stomach all around the is of uh, gastroesophageal junction trying to create a new gastroesophageal junction which kind of strengthens the hiatus the esophageal hiatus another interesting point from the anatomical perspective here is to note that hiatus has a fibrous component and it has a muscular component whenever we are repairing we have to be very careful that the fibrous component has tissue tensile strength and our suture bites must include the fibrous component as well so it is very easy to think that if we just repair the muscle it is good but it is not sufficient Uh, then in today's times we generally prefer a partial fundoplication because a complete nissen's fundoplication causes a lot of uh, post operative complications so partial fundoplication can either be an anterior which is a door or a posterior which is a toupee 
uh, an anterior frontal plication is 180 degree or posterior is 250 uh, 250 degrees uh, these are the procedures that are generally done by gi surgeons and okay uh, because they are predominantly in the mediastinum so thoracic surgeons don't venture into that territory but for completion sake i thought it was important to note the last bit of hernia that we should know about is traumatic hernias this is the most common thing that comes to a thoracic surgeon and it is very important to understand that if it is an acute hernia it can be repaired from the abdomen it can be repaired from the thorax no problems but if it is a chronic hernia we should not try and repair it from the abdomen we should insist that we repair it from the thorax the reason being that it forms adhesions the lung and the abdominal organs they will stick to each other and then they will form adhesions and if we try to pull these in a chronic state from the abdomen we are liable to cause more harm than good so if the patient presents like within uh, say uh, within one month of trauma which is an acute injury you can uh, a general surgeon or a gi surgeon may attempt to reduce it from the abdomen either by laparoscopy or a thoracoscopy or conventional laparotomy or uh, thoracotomy that is not the problem the only most important thing to reduce the morbidity of the patient is that if the patient is presenting late please try to reduce it from the chest and uh, any problem in the diaphragm we have to remember three things one is the distribution of the phrenic nerve so we need to remember where to cut the diaphragm it cannot be cut uh, randomly at any position second important thing is that if at any point in the surgery we feel that the muscle is thin don't go for primary repair please uh, use a mesh uh, tension free repair is as important as ensuring that there is strength on the diaphragmatic uh, surface because even if we repair a, a flimsy muscle layer because of whenever the hernias are chronic the muscle it becomes thinned out and flimsy so then it does not stay down what happens is that if a flimsy muscle is repaired then it looks like an eventration on a post operative x ray and that reduces the respiratory mechanics so that is very important to understand Uh, so this is all about the four types of hernias. Oh, thank you, Dr. Pallavi. Uh, that was your answer was directed to Dr. Ari Khan from Rajasthan. You wanted to know more about hiatus hernia. You've done it well. Uh, second, I was about to put you a question, but you answered it uh, about the GI surgeons. They would have come hammer and tongs over the thoracic surgeons if you said, you know, this is our domain. But I'm so happy that you mentioned that we should not cross over. And you stress the point about uh, chronic problems being dealt from the thoracic approach. Uh, I have a question to Doctor Jairaman. Has he gone? Is he here? Yes, sir. I'm here, sir. Yeah. I mean, this is not a political question, but uh, something for me as well. Uh, we've been talking about diaphragm. You are the pulmonologist. You guys talk about physiology. You talked about various types of breathing. What is your opinion about yoga, with uh, related to diaphragmatic breathing? Yeah, yoga forms one of the adjuvant treatment for uh, our respiratory muscle function. So usually in our physiotherapy department, pulmonary rehabilitation department, we used to teach each and every uh, the uh, you know, uh, chronic lung disease patient. In a case of uh, mild diaphragm elevation, mild diaphragmatic palsy, also. The diaphragm inspiratory muscle training we give to the patients routinely by our rehabilitation team, pulmonary rehabilitation team. It will improve the strengthening of the diaphragm muscle. So slowly, in the case of neuropraxia or mild weakness of the diaphragm, definitely the yoga is one of the adjunct treatment. This is one of the modality of the you know inspiratory muscle training. So we all know well diaphragm is the main uh, respiratory, mainly the two participate in the inspiration. So the diaphragmatic inspiratory muscle training is a very very useful procedure. This is a part and parcel of the yoga. So we do it as a breathing exercises by our pulmonary our pulmonary rehabilitation team. Definitely there is a role in a uh, definite role in a uh, uh, rehabilitation program in the case of uh, diaphragmatic palsy, in the case of neuropraxia or mild elevation of diaphragm with a symptomatic patient. There is a different role of yoga and breathing exercises and the pulmonary rehabilitation. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Jairam. Now, uh, as we are running out of time, we are heading for the last round of questions. I shall start with Dr. Nickel. Uh, I have a question, but and the question would be, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, diaphragm, the muscle, the thin muscle, which separates the disorders of the chest from the disorders of the bubble. Uh, similarly, fluid above the diaphragm, fluid below the diaphragm. 
Yes, sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, in case of the peridiaphragmatic collections, that is uh, supradiaphragmatic or subdiaphragmatic, which is pleural effusion or ascites respectively. Uh, ultrasound, CT and MRI are helpful in differentiating uh, ascites versus pleural fluid. And there are uh, multiple signs on CT which can differentiate between the two. Like uh, the diaphragmatic center which is in on the outside in the pleural effusion and is in the center in ascites. The crust is displaced posterior medial to the uh, posterior medially in ascites and anterior laterally in pleural effusion and bare area is seen in ascites and it is not seen in pleural effusion. The interface uh, with the abdominal viscera is sharp in ascites and hazy in pleural effusion because diaphragm is there and uh, the lung is anterior to the collection, uh, sorry, uh, lung is anterior in ascites and however, uh, the pleural effusion surrounds the lung. Uh, cordly, uh, when we uh, move cordly, the ascites increases and pleural effusion decreases, while cranially, the ascites decreases and pleural effusion increases. So these are some of the signs which differentiate ascites from pleural effusion. Thank you so much. Uh, do you wish to add something which we have missed out? From a radiography point of view, because we are closing up our you know, last legs, as they say, of the discussion. But keep in mind, if you have anything, just raise your hand if you wish to. Uh, I move now to Dr. Bhushan. Dr. Bhushan, uh, what about diaphragmatic trauma? Would you like to say something? Which is yeah. the. I will just share my screen. Today? Yeah, very, very, very small. I will show one case that will solve. This is a 25 year old gentleman with a steering wheel injury. Uh, came to the emergency department with a mild breathlessness and chest pain. Uh, X-ray was done, which showed the left lower zone haziness. A immediate CT scan was done, which showed this picture. So you can see in this, the stomach is gone up into the chest and we can see, if you see carefully, the arrow mentions the part of diaphragm here, one gray area. Now I can show the wax view, which was showing the tear in the uh, diaphragm, this thing. And the same patient, I will show a video. Okay. So more commonly a diagnosis on the left side, they can be missed initially. Uh, appearance of bowel, stomach or nasogastric tube is uh, more of diagnostic on uh, a chest x-ray. Blunt trauma produces large tears and leads to a herniation of the major organs, uh, intra-abdominal contents. Uh, care should be taken uh, while putting a chest tube in these patients or should be avoided unless and until you have a CT or a definite diagnosis available. Treatment is by direct, as Dr. Pallavi said, uh, direct repair. Uh, if it is a recent one, laparoscopic repair can be attempted and a chronic one, thoracoscopic or open surgery 
can be attempted. Any questions? Oh, good, good. I think uh, any quickly anything about post op management quickly. Yeah, and, uh, uh, which post particular, any particular after post after that for a diaphragmatic injury, you know, rupture abdomen, where vessel, I mean, the uh, viscera up into the chest. Anything you would like to say or the usual post op management? So, yeah, rehabilitation is uh, uh, very important in these cases. Uh, uh, the, the patient uh, is extubated, uh, depend or intubate kept intubated, uh, depending on the tier and what type of repair you have done. Uh, generally, the breathing exercises are allowed after uh, one or two days, and early mobilization is required. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Tarang, you're there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Yeah. You have anything to uh, say? Otherwise, others, I'll put you the last question. Uh, so, I, uh, so yeah, I mean, we can proceed with the question. Yes. Okay. So just basically, any, any uh, further comments on yoga or how do you do diaphragmatic breathing? Can you demonstrate or just explain? And the last one, diaphragmatic pacing. Do you do it at your center or any one or one or two lines of diaphragmatic pacing? Okay. So, uh, as uh, Dr. Jairaman said, diaphragmatic pacing would be uh, m the most important aspect in diaphragmatic pacing is you have to make sure that the diaphragmatic nerve is intact. Uh, so, and it diaphragmatic pacing, uh, it can be done uh, superficially or it can also be done invasively. And uh, generally, uh, in my center, no, we haven't haven't done diaphragmatic pacing as it. But I'm sure Dr. Jairaman has experience with it. No? Okay. <laughs> and what about yoga? Can you demonstrate it or just explain how do you do diaphragmatic breathing? So, yes. So diaphragmatic breathing in generally is, uh, as Dr. Jairaman sir said it rightly, it's all about inspiratory muscle exercises. What you're trying to do is since diaphragmatic is a primary and, and inspiratory uh, breathing muscle, you try to uh, strengthen the rest of the inspiratory muscles as well with these breathing exercises where you try to have a good coordination of your abdomen and your thorax and this actually brings in the muscle training and thus you know that is what diaphragmatic breathing is all about yeah at this juncture we have got an excellent comment from dr ravi chandra jargana hali must be from karnataka he says very impressed with all of you uh, thank you dr ravi chandra for joining us at that comment um, further on this at this point, I have to thank the services, support, and suggestions of our founder president, Dr. Krishna, Dr. Narayana Pradeep, um, and of course, the current president, Dr. Ashish Dubey, and the dynamic secretary, Anil Maske. Don't worry, Pallavi, I have not forgotten you. You have something interesting to tell us about diaphragmatic palsy and its uh, surgical procedures on a few lines. Uh, yeah. uh, I would like to just uh, show a little bit about uh, diaphragmatic plication Please because do. I'm sure if uh, that, that might be interesting uh, for people to understand. Uh, this was the uh, conventional method of uh, diaphragmatic plication wherein uh, because of the risk of phrenic nerve injury, people used to start suturing it to the ribs. So this was called a radical plication technique. Uh, then we started coming up with the U-stitch or a central um, imbrication technique, which is uh, the currently the most commonly used technique today, uh, wherein we uh, make a make multiple imbrications on the diaphragm by uh, suturing it in and out, in and out, in and out, and then pull the sutures to cause imbrication. Uh, the next technique that has now developed is the uh, staple technique, wherein uh, we'll just lift the weak point of the diaphragm and staple it away. So the diaphragm gets rejected and uh, that just serves the purpose. And trans-abdominally, uh, a lot of surgeons can also do what is called an accordion technique. This is done through the abdomen, wherein what you do is uh, you uh, kind of stitch the diaphragm over itself. Uh, the risk here is that if there are adhesions on the chest side, then this causes the lung to be trapped and then it further affects the lung movement. So it is uh, best to be avoided. And the most common uh, technique that is used is a uh, diaphragmatic plication, wherein what we do is we first try to see the redundant part of the diaphragm. Once we've assessed that, then we take sutures uh, 
a u stitch is taken from one end to the other end and then the diaphragmatic muscle is brought together with a uh, suture technique uh, what happens is this is how the diaphragm just one corner to the other corner and then you pull the stitch and uh, uh, this starts um, uh, uh, to uh, come closer to each other as you can see in this video that uh, as we we'll start pulling the switch these two diaphragmatic muscles would start coming closer to each other so uh, and this is how we'll just uh, carry this forward from the posterior lateral to the and uh, posterior uh, lateral to the anteromedial side and this is how it looks finally uh, so th these are the possible techniques uh, that are used for uh, diaphragmatic plication yeah doctor probably the last question to you yes sir how would you decide whether to use a mesh or whether you just like it the diaphragm and is the scene more on the left side or right side and why is it so and if it is left side would you have another another approach sir uh, diaphragmatic uh, unilateral diaphragmatic uh, eventration is more common on the left side uh, but uh, uh, plication is the most commonly used technique and mesh uh, is not uh, very commonly used only if it is a very very old uh, diaphragmatic plication and the patient is having a severe respiratory morbidity uh, then you might consider that the diaphragm the muscle is too weak or too thinned out at that point you might consider reinforcing the plication with the mesh instead of uh, trying to reject the diaphragm it would be good to first do the plication and then reinforce it with a mesh Uh, but uh, normally just plication works good enough because uh, indications for diaphragmatic surgery for eventration are also very few uh, we uh, i must stress here that uh, yes diaphragmatic eventration is asymptomatic in most patient and even when it comes with symptoms we try to do uh, non surgical therapy that is give good physiotherapy etc and wait for 6 months before we offer definitive surgery to these patients especially when patients are coming with respiratory distress uh, we have to make sure that other causes are ruled out and as jeremon sir mentioned uh, if there is a neuromuscular disorder or uh, muscle dystrophy then please don't do a diaphragmatic plication for eventration have you seen recurrence after plication or when a follow up after 5 years 10 years follow up uh, so it has been reported in literature the recurrence rate uh, has been reported up to uh, 3 to 5% in literature uh, i have personally done very few cases of diaphragmatic plication and for now i have not seen a recurrence thank you for a very honest reply to the questions i don't want to get into a debate on those things being a surgeon uh thank you so much uh, uh dr pallavi dr jeraman final comments from you you're the senior guy overall yes, view sir. yes sir yeah as the intervals of pulmonologist point of view before putting the icd so many occasions we receive the call from the emergency department we have a case like uh, some uh, multiple injury cases with uh, breathlessness and there is uh, x ray showing there is a uh, looks like some uh, traumatic uh, pneumothorax come and put icd so this is the call we often receive from the emergency department so we went ahead and saw the patient this actually a gastrothorax diaphragmatic uh, rupture causing eventration there is a herniation of stomach into the uh, thoracic cavity mimicking as uh, hydrothorax there is a uh, pneumothorax So actually, this is a gastrothorax. So before putting ICD, double sure that you can place the ICD in the stomach canton. This is a very very important uh, take home from my side because initially we had some of the cases. So call to see this patient. Uh, suppose everything is ready, ICD, everything is ready. Then my boss, uh, my teacher, Dr. Sandosum came and uh, saw page zero. This is not a case of uh, uh, pneumothorax. This is a traumatic gastrothorax. See, this is a gastric bundle. Uh, Say that everything is there here. So we need to do the thoracic surgery. After services of the patient uh, through the therapeutic method, so that Sandhu Sam did the uh, the uh, no diaphragm repair and they put ICD for the hematorrhagic part. So before putting ICD, we will show that don't place the ICD in the stomach. This is a very important take home from my side. Thank you. Very 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 well said. Most practical point. Uh, everything good has to come to an end. Similarly, the magic curtain, Doctor Three's words, is ringing down on the. proceedings of this evening i thank dr pallavi dr bhushan dr tarun dr nikhil and jayaraman for their active participation with big smiles on their face i hope all of you enjoyed it as much as we did uh, i should also thank the sponsors sipla dr uh, mr vipul shah the vendors dr mr amit mr vinod 
and that's it thank you everybody uh, thank you sir very wonderful thank moderation you, thank you cci thank you. i learned a lot of things from this uh, that very different uh, thanks to at3 and dr kiran and all the stalwarts of cci family i enjoyed the lecture of dr pallavi tarang and bhushan sir so nikhil thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity thank you, uh, sir. Thank you sir. i hope all of you leave enriched and enlightened with this evening thank, thank you everybody thank you, thank you, thank you. thanks thank you